He offers some ways to avoid getting trapped in what he calls the ETF vortex. Jack Bogle, the founder of Vanguard Group, who as I don't know his precise age, he might be near 90 now, is very active and he speaks and Which writes. Is ironic in itself, I guess. Yes. <laughs> he speaks, yeah, he speaks and writes daily. And Jim Grant invited me to debate him um, at, this past, at the spring conference. Um, and even he, you can't find a more committed proponent of long-term buy and hold equities, use a broad index like the S&P 500, than he. Yeah. When I prepared to debate him, I had a challenge. Um, I had two challenges. One challenge was, what if I beat him in debate? <laughs> What's your upside here? Yeah. <laughs> That's, and if I lost, well, yeah, I don't look good either. So I, I, really, I, I wanted very much to, to, to read what he's written and to listen to what he said recently. But as I did so, I began to realize I agree with 95% of what he says about the market and how to invest in the market. And he's gone through some figures. We've gone through the same figures. And even for that 5% differential, I found if I thought a certain way, I even agree with most, most of what he's doing there. Because here's the difference. I don't have to think the way he thinks. I have clients who can afford consultative services. Yep. His constituents are the average American saver. And I looked at some of the statistics. So based on, based on the US Census data, for the average household in the United States that has savings, because many of them don't, for such a household where, with a 34-year-old head of household, do you know what the average savings are, financial savings? I've looked at this. It's, it's low. It's 20 grand, maybe? Yeah, $24,000. Yeah. And given the expected rates of return from bonds and stocks, they might not make it, given, yeah. given the average savings rate, which is about 5.5%. So those are his constituents, what he calls the little guy or gal or Main Street. How are they to possibly know what we're talking about? Yeah. Forget choosing an individual security. How can they choose an ETF? How can they choose a manager? He knows that. They're vulnerable. They're vulnerable to the predations of Wall Street products yeah. and that business model. And he understands what the implications are of current valuations. But he wants to give them the least risk approach. Sure. Just buy and hold. And if he can at least get them to hold on when things are down because you just buy and hold, he'll have done them a good service. So from Jack Bogle, here are his expectations for the return from the S&P 500 for the next 10 years. He'll say, yeah, you might get 4 or 5%. And he'll run through the numbers. Everybody has, can work it through differently. We come up with lower numbers than he does. Mm -hmm. But it's very basic math. Look, you're starting with a 2% dividend yield, not 4 or 5 anymore. Yeah. And you can't really account on corporate profit growth being 6% anymore for reasons we can talk about but we don't want to do here. And then you have to choose an ending PE, and maybe it should be 15. And you run the numbers, that's what you're going to get. Yeah. Well, Jeremy Grantham's similar, right? Jeremy Grantham's yeah. talking about declines over the next 10 years for the S&P. And yes. he's lost a billion dollars of assets under management. Because what, what happens is, here's the problem. So you got articulate people like Jeremy Grantham or whomever talking about uh, Jim Grant. And we sound, we, we, we sound like hysterics because, look, everything's fine. Yeah. But that's the way it always feels during a bubble. Yeah. And, and, and the problem is you can't prove it in advance. All you can know is that you're wrong and you're demonstrably wrong every single quarter that goes by yep. while that which we say is irrationally priced gets more irrationally priced. And, and therein lies the problem. So I'm trying to educate people. I'll give you some more titillating examples of, well, we, we had this discussion. I don't want to... I don't want to say, I don't want to cast stones, because certainly you get into that frame of mind and, and everybody, everybody can uh, get stoned. So what I'll say is, this semantic issue, some more examples of what you think you're buying is not what you're buying. So pick an ETF and evaluate it just the way we did when we started with the um, QQQ. QQQ. The PE is not the PE. Yeah. The diversification is not the diversification. So if you looked at 
I think it's the Spain, the iShares Spain ETF. Let's say you didn't know much about stocks, but you, you, you read and you think, I think Spain's been oversold. It had its crises. It was a deep crisis, but they've recovered. The market hasn't come back. And it's a dynamic, it has its dynamic spots in the economy. I'd like to buy some. All I want is exposure to Spain. Right. Diversified exposure. So you buy this Spain ETF. And first of all, nobody tells you that the top 10 companies account for 70% of the weight. It's not diversified, number one. So now you're actually buying individual stock risk. Okay, I'm willing to live with that. But nobody told you that six of the top 10 holdings get 74% of their revenues from outside of Spain. Yeah. So buy Spain, you're investing outside of Spain, because yeah. these are multinational corporations. You're exposed to risks everywhere, whether it's REITs or Spain or emerging market bonds or emerging market stocks or large cap growth or small cap growth that are not what you're being told they are. They're really being driven by liquidity, meaning buying pressure yep. for certain kinds of stocks, and low interest rates. And on your pie chart, you might look semantically diversified, and you're not diversified whatsoever. You're really exposed to one great big interest rate play. And fortunately, the response to that is to recognize that, we'll call it the ETF divide. So most of the world now looks at investing through the lens of indexation, Stocks fit into this vortex, or they don't. They can be excluded for reasons that have very little to do with how the business is doing. Uh, a little too much inside ownership. Mm -hmm. It might have a little multi-industry stuff going on. Maybe it, it's in two businesses. Um, and it might, be, it might be a country or an industry sector that, for one reason or another, just has a very small weighting in the global yep. indexation scheme. So, you can use the rule set in your favor. You take the opposite side of it. So one example is you say, what if I took the MSCI Global um, Index and they break down the world into country weightings and industry sector weightings? And what if I look for an, a country that has a very low weighting, maybe lower than it should be, like Norway? Maybe it's 20 basis points. Mm -hmm. And maybe there are some companies there that are just underrepresented in the indexes, don't have this buying power, or aren't included in the indexes, and they're too cheap. Or what if I look for an industry sector, like shipping, that's underrepresented? That's also maybe 20 basis points. Or maybe I do a cross-section of the two, a Venn diagram. Right. Norwegian shipping companies. I believe there are some. <laughs> and you will find some terribly well-run companies, profitable, Strong balance sheets that could be trading at a half a book value, that might have a 7 or 8 or 9% dividend yield, that are actually growing. So in the new world for value investors, if you understand to look outside of the, uh, or beneath the ETF divide, it used to be that you had to find companies, there was something wrong with them. Yeah. I heard Paul Isaac talking about it. Find something that's down, there's a reason it's down. Evaluate the reason. Is it management? Is it process? Yep. Is it one thing? Is it regulatory? Is it permanent or transitory? Is it resolvable? How much time might that take? How big a discount am I getting for that? But there's a reason it's down having to do with fundamentals. But now there are stocks that are low simply because they're not in an index. Yeah. It's an amazingly interesting world. And it's important not to be in the index, not to have exposure to the systemic risk that all the index-centric securities have. That's what you need to do. It could well be that in the new world, as it develops, that in order to be effectively, not semantically, but effectively diversified, you're going to want to have fewer, not more securities, but securities that are truly idiosyncratic yep. in how they'll behave. Meaning, whether they do well or not, or how well they do or how well they don't, meaning it won't be a function of the systemic risk like interest rate manipulation or, or the flow of funds by institutions, yeah. right? It'll be on its own. That's what we mean by proper diversification. It'll correlate differently. Well, for if its nobody own owns it, no one can sell it. Yes. I mean, but, the, but the implications of this are extraordinary they because, are. I mean, if we think this through, A, it doesn't really matter what a company's performance is anymore 
because to your point about McDonald's, it doesn't matter if the company has a bad announcement, who's going to sell the shares? They're not going to just sell the basket. If you're a value investor, it's never been a more lush environment for you to go find these stocks. But if you find them and you pick them, who else is going to buy them to make them go up? Now you can, you can pick the, make the smartest stock picks in the world. Well, but now, to your point, there are value traps, but yeah. there are companies that are actually growing. Yeah. So let's say I find a company that's below liquidation book value, that's a PE of eight, eight times free cash flow, but it's actually growing, it has a nice ROE, it has a business. Yeah. So unless the PE is going to go to zero over time, right. even though it always stays but at eight. But you just got to buy it and it's going, kind of yes. wait. But you're going to underperform the market yeah. while the market is doing this. Right? That's the conundrum. That's the business end of investment management. The thing is that there are so many things one can do, including income. So we went through that income exercise, right? It applies there on that people need yield. Yeah. They really need income. Like it's important. So how do you know it's a yield crisis? It's a real yield crisis. If you have a million dollars saved up, you did it. You were a dentist, you were a lawyer, you were a plumber. You did it. You saved a million dollars. You have a million dollar portfolio and you put it all into 10-year treasury notes. You want to be safe yeah. at 2.1%. So you get $21,000 a year, yeah. and then you pay taxes on it? You'll starve. Yeah. You can't live. That's a crisis. Okay. And you look around. Ten-year treasuries are 2%, and the high-yield bond fund is 5%, and that's, that's a risky investment. Sure. Okay. That's when you look through the index-centric lens. The same dynamic applies. If you go below the ETF divide, where you're not be, price is not being determined by pure liquidity, I can find you a, a, a dozen, dozens of different securities of different sure. types. Some are straight bonds, some are not, some are pure equity, some are quasi, that will give you a yield of five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven percent with varying degrees. Some could be very, very modest, and some would be quite substantial of either direct value optionality or um, kind of intrinsic modest growth. But they have to be individually selected. Yep. You're not going to find them in a basket. And they're around. And, and when, I, when I apprise people of this, I say, let me give you some examples. They're satisfied. Some people might not want pure equities. They just I want to stick with something that's more like a bond, like a convertible bond or a preferred stock, or maybe even a closed-end fund that has some certain kinds of securities in it. That can be done also. And something I didn't, I wouldn't have brought it up at the grants conference. Um, but there is a developing asset class. Now, in the indexation world, they use asset class in the financial world very loosely, as if utility stocks are different assets. Right, They're right. stocks. Yeah. It's an asset yeah. class. They behave not much differently than other stocks. But there is a new asset class developing. And a year ago, or more, a year and a half ago, we started writing about it. We wrote about it in terms of pure optionality of an extraordinary magnitude but toss up, it could go to zero, or it could go up a thousand fold or five thousand fold. Right? That if you could buy the minimum amount, like 25 basis points in your portfolio, it could permanently and meaningfully improve your financial life. Meaning, if you have, if you have a 25 basis point position in a hundred thousand dollar portfolio, and it goes up a thousand fold, you now have a three hundred fifty thousand dollar portfolio. Yeah. Do you know what I'm talking about? I'm guessing it's Bitcoin. Okay, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin. Yeah. Okay. Without going into details about it now, because it's a whole another set of, 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 of discussion. But the idea is that cryptocurrencies are genuinely a new asset class. And for the first time, again, in recorded financial history, there is a method to escape both government or fiat currency or coinage and the inflationary um, effects, either the government's reek 
upon holders of currency or the market does. So throughout history, any time a, a government of some sort had control of currency, they would inevitably dilute it. If you read certain books like History of Money or The Story of Money, um, like Roman Empire, if you read the sequences, generation by generation, of all the different leaders and how they would debase the currency, they would put alloy into it, yep. they would make it smaller, they would do various things, even just change the weighting system. You could see it's almost mind numbingly boring after a while. It happens over and over and over well, again. And, and the commonality is they all did it until the point where it collapsed. Until the point where it yeah. collapsed. But it's meaningful because over someone's working life, you have coinage and you originally put $100 into it. And by the end of your working life, it's only worth $20. That's the basement of the currency. It happens right now. So last year, M2 growth, money supply growth in the United States was a certain number. And real GDP growth was another number. And the difference between them was the increase in the money supply in a way that is basically diluting, basically the inflation of your currency, of about 3% plus. That adds up. The yield crisis problem is that we had a 3% inflation rate for most of the century, on average. Your treasury bills, on their own, your, if that's where you put all your money, or, or your dollars, your dollars were diluted by 90%. Yep. But it was okay because treasury bills gave you a higher yield than the inflation rate. But that's not happening anymore. Nope. Okay. So, that's government intervention or manipulation. But then, when people would flee, if they could, if they lived in a place where they could, they lost confidence in the government monetary system, so they bought something else, like gold. The problem, though, was, in, was inflation. So you buy the gold, and it helps you for a while. And the value of the gold begins to go up, because more people are buying it. But if it goes up enough, you have the supply problem, because more supply comes on, from any, from any number of sources, and then you get a collapse. So, a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, um, is the first time in history we have a currency that is not dilutable because there will only be 21 million bitcoins, 21.000 bitcoins in the year 2140. Right now there are 16.4 million. The average annualized inflation, if you will, between now and then is like 0.2% a year. But it can't go any further, number one. And number two, it solves the authentication problem. Can't, can't be counterfeited. So the first time people can have, hold a, a, a form of currency that's not dilutable. That's a that could be a store of value. So by the very fact of holding Bitcoin for the sake of argument, price is wild now. It's not, it's not accepted yeah. yet. But there are 3.5% more dollars in existence on a real basis. That means my, my Bitcoin, by just standing still, is worth 3.5% more. Yep. Okay? So this is, a, this is kind of a seminal event. Now, a year ago, even six months ago, I would say 50-50. Goes to zero, goes up a thousandfold or 10,000. And I can tell you how to calculate that at home, all by yourself. With that, why don't people, most people don't know about it. If they do, they've heard so many wildly yep. di diverse they're, they're opinions. They're not it's complex. It's, yeah. it's, you walk away from it. But you really shouldn't. I actually, I actually suggest it to my clients. I, I, went through a, uh, an experiment with them, a thought experiment, to see why it would, be, it, would be, it would be imprudent of me as a fiduciary to not buy them some. Right. And let me explain why that is. So, we're not accustomed to thinking about anything that can go up a thousandfold. Right? If your sister-in-law or brother-in-law calls you with some special business they're doing and they want you to contribute, you now have a headache. Because <laughs> it's a social problem. Yeah. But you're not really going to invest a lot of money because you understand it's probably going to go under, right? So you're not going to put too much money in. You put a little bit in. So you, socially, you can get away yep. with it. And if they surprise you and it goes up a lot, so what's it going to double or triple or quadruple? When people think of wonderful stock, a winner, it went up threefold or fourfold, but that's not going to change your life. You're not going to put enough money in yeah. for it to change your life. That's the model we're accustomed to. We're, it's natural that we would, we would, we would poo-poo a Bitcoin. Except, we're not accustomed to thinking of a thousand-fold return. So with a thousand-fold return, what you can do is, how do you game this? You, 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 you game the risk 
by sizing it. Yeah. You can buy a size that wouldn't in any other normal circumstance be worthwhile bothering for. So if you have a $100,000 portfolio, for the cost of taking your in-laws out for dinner, not even a great restaurant, $250, 25 basis points, yeah. that you forget about. If it worked, you have that result. Or if you have a million dollar portfolio, and my business partner Murray likes to talk about the vacation you never should have taken. Yep. Right? Fine. It started off when you got in the cab right. at the airport, right. and it never got better after that. <laughs> That's what we're talking yeah. about. Now, how do you get to these numbers? By the way, it's the reason I'm talking about it. I'm not talking about this as a stock idea. Hey, it's a hot stock. If you want a defense against systemic risk, yeah. this exists outside the system. What the central banks are doing, for the first time in history, have coordinated massive multi-year attempt to artificially bring rates to zero. And with whatever risks come from that, this exists outside that system. Yeah. This is both an independent, diversifying investment, and it's also a natural hedge. Think about it. It's a hedge against all the world's currencies. Yeah. They're all trying to depreciate their currencies, but you can't depreciate currencies relative to each other if you're all doing the same thing. So a year ago, I would have said, heads or tails, zero, it might get market acceptance. That changed, that equation changed, I think, in terms of probability, just quite recently. So, as of April 30th, I think, April 30th, in Japan, do you know about this? Yeah. Okay, so you know about this. They changed the Japan Banking Act, and they recognized Bitcoin as a, a, uh, a medium of exchange, as a transactional currency. Not a full currency, but they accepted it. They legalized it. And in mid-June, I think there were 5,000 stores in Japan that accepted Bitcoin, including kiosks, like an ATM, for using it. I don't know in the, scope, in, the, in the context of Japan whether that's a lot or little. I don't know whether those are mom and pop shops or the great big change. I don't know. I will tell you, though, that when I learned about this, I tried to get some articles about it. I did a five-minute word search on Google. It's not exhaustive. Every combination of Japan, Banking Act, Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, Japan. Cryptocurrency websites aside, yeah. I couldn't find mention of it in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Washington Post, Forbes, nowhere. Do you know I found a reasonably good article about it? In the Shomi Uri Shinbun. Yeah, Yomi, Yomi Uri Shinbun, yeah. 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 Okay, it's a Japanese paper. It's the largest circulation newspaper in the world. I think they have 11 million subscribers. That's where they described it. Now, you might infer that the Japanese government is doing this because they would like to encourage some of their savers to part with their yen and expend them right. to help their economy. Okay. You can confirm that because as of July 1st, in a few days, Japan will also remove the 8% surcharge on purchases made with Bitcoin. And also on, on, on uh, July 1st, I believe, um, Australia has recognized, is recognizing Bitcoin as legal tender and is removing a 10% surcharge on its use. That, I think, is a seminal event. Yeah. These are two major banks approving cryptocurrency. And I think that you can't, this is intellectual, this is intellectual content, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. Bed recall, I don't remember, it was in the 70s, probably the 70s, not the 80s, of a Princeton undergraduate for his physics uh, term paper wrote a detailed, comprehensive guide to building a nuclear bomb, including costing it out. It was like $12,000 or $20,000, including the price of plutonium, if you could get it. Right. The CIA or NSA or whoever was all over him, wanting to know where he got this information. And I think his response wasn't much different than, than probably um, uh, Tom Clancy gave when he wrote the submarine um, novel, right. uh, Hunting for Red October. Yeah. He said, guys, it's in the library. It's not all in one place. Yeah. You have to do a little work. Now, they, they permitted him to publish that paper exclusive of two critical pages. Okay? The point, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. Yeah. And this really is a different asset class. And it's new. It has its complexities. But 
it's important for anybody talking or thinking about long-term investing in asset allocation. It's not going away. Well, you know, I, I, I hate to keep you any longer because I've taken up so much of your time, but I, I have to, there's so much more I want to talk about. Yeah, here. we could talk for, for a day. Yeah, but... And but, I'm not even Paul Isaac. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, we have to finish this at some point, but I, I, have, before you go, I have to ask you, for the people sitting at home, and there will be a vast percentage of them who are up to their necks in ETFs, how should they think about this? How should they think about it? What should they do about it? Or is, I mean, is there an escape from this? Well, it's, 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 it's a little bit of a conundrum. Yeah. There's a short-term answer, a long-term answer, and there's a proviso in the middle. Yeah. One proviso, which is always applied in investing, is I can have a good idea. I find a certain niche, a certain inefficiency, and I can do it. And my firm can do it. And we can make a good money for clients for a long time. But then other people find out about it and they start doing it. And then it will cause its own collapse. Yes. Or at least the inefficiency will be, will be, will be bled oh, out. Of it. Yeah, absolutely. So that proviso is people who are listening or thinking about this and want to go to different places that are a little safer, they can do it. But not everybody can do it. Yeah. Fortunately, not everybody will want to right now because they don't believe it, they don't see exactly it. Exactly right. So one thing one can do is, you might not be equipped to buy individual securities and analyze them that are not in, I mean, that, that are below the ETF divide. I say it's cheap, but if you don't have the tools, how do you know? You can find a fund or fund manager who has a particular specialty, who's got a long history uh, of doing this, and their performance like as not in the last five or 10 years, meaning since the financial crisis, relative to the indexes, don't look great. Yeah. Like the names I mentioned. So you can't go by that. Sure. In broad terms, so for instance, Chuck Royce, he has mutual funds, buy his stuff. He's got small cap and micro cap mutual funds. He's, he's a value manager with very consistent standards and, um, very um, um, disclosed approaches, and um, there's no reason he shouldn't do well over time. And he has done well over time, just not as well as the market lately. Yeah. Um, there are even closed-end funds that he has where you can buy the same as the mutual fund except at a 12, 13% discount, 10 AV. Okay. Or people like Mary Gabelli or others. So there are, there are active managers out there with an operating history and a reputation um, uh, who are more outside, don't have overlap, as much overlap with the broad market. Uh, I think if you look at Chuck Royce's, even, even his, his um, small cap fund, the holdings in there, he's only, only about 10 or 12% of the, 15 or, let's say 15 odd percent of the holdings are in the index he's benchmarked against. Like, like, like the Russell 2000 or something like that, okay? So he's not really exposed to the same material. On a longer term basis, I think there will be a, it might take decades to happen, an evolution of asset management. So indexation is not going away. That's the default. Yeah. I don't think the whole market will collapse because there's no place for it to go. It doesn't mean sectors can't, you know? It might happen sooner, sooner than later that maybe there's an asset allocation away from these read indexes. Well, that's the thing. Now that these institutions are yeah. in these, if they reallocate. If they reallocate, you can find yeah. a sector by or certain sectors can collapse. So over time, what might develop is that active managers have their own faults. And one of the faults is that they too very often acted not as investors, but they began to, to degrade into asset gatherers. Mm -hmm. You want more assets, you gather more assets, there's a limited supply of what you can buy that you know. So either you buy those and you bid them up and your new investors don't do as well, or you start buying securities outside your circle of competence and your new investors don't do so well. And they're part of the, the, the fault, okay? Um, so what can happen though is managers for the future, active managers, they should focus on that which they do well. 
It might be a certain type of security. It might be a certain industry or two or three. It might be a certain style. But that's what they do well. And if they're wise, they will not continue or desire to continue collecting assets yeah. or assets if they yeah. do well. They're going to cap it. So they don't invite competition. And, and they, don't, they, don't, um, um, they don't dilute what they have. And for asset allocators, the way it might evolve, perhaps, is they will look for managers who are doing something very specific. They have an expertise in, I don't know, forest products. And even though forest products might, may do, might not be doing well, you know, the 10 companies they buy do, yeah. right? Yeah. And so because of that definition, they will clearly not ha they will not be able to be measured on a relative basis to the broad index. They're going to have to be measured on some absolute return basis. Can you get 10% a year over a five-year period? And if they don't measure up, then they'll be dismissed. But, and then the money will go back into index as a default. Yeah. But there'll be a constellation that they'll start looking for for managers with a particular specialty who hew to their, to their, to their strong points. And it might develop that way. I don't think we spoke here in, on the camera about the relative impossibility of any significant part of the existing equity market, and that's indexed, of course, finding another index-based approach. Small cap stocks, as defined, I think it's under $1 billion or $2 billion, or something like that, they only represent like 4.5% of the $18 trillion of U.S. equity market value. Yeah. People can't go there en masse. They just can't. So some people can. So unfortunately, it's not the kind of advice from a policy basis that Jack Bogle could give. Right. It doesn't work for everybody. No, That's of course. The problem. So it depends on your audience and who they are, and if they have enough understanding to be able to use some of the steps I'm talking about. Now, even and the problem is you 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 know to 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 give somebody you know. Advice from a distance is very dangerous. Oh, uh, yeah. No, no, no. I, yeah. And that's not what I'm looking for. I say, I say cryptocurrency, you can't just go out and buy Bitcoin. Right. You have to learn about it. It's complex. You have to learn these things. If one learned about it, if there were an easy way to buy it that was safe and secure and so forth, let's say it just existed, everybody should own yeah. a, a nominal amount. Nominal meaning that if it goes to zero, it doesn't affect your you life. You won't even know till a week later. It does not yeah. affect your life yeah. at all. But it could actually, over time, benefit you to the degree that it, 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 it changes the safety profile of your financial yeah. life. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's funny, you know, when you talk about this and we talk about solutions, they all point to one place, which is active management. Whether it's your own responsibility for it or it's finding those managers. Um, Actually, it doesn't have to be. We've been talking about indexation yeah. as practiced. Yeah. Here's a great flaw with it. But indexation can be improved. It's just there hasn't been a motive yet for them to improve it. Although we've, we've made some early attempts. So the flaw with indexation now is, first of all, the market cap weighting system. Yep. Okay. That's one problem. The other is that it is essentially a descriptive system. They have descriptive attributes. So when you talk about market capitalization or industry sector or historical price variability, all of these things, they describe it, but they don't tell you how it will do in the future. Yes. So the, uh, the notion of, of, of predictive attributes, are there attributes you can look for, create an index that is, that is indicative of a certain degree of performance? in the future. And we've taken a hand at, at developing some. I'll give you an example of one only. One more. I've already overstayed my welcome. So within the S&P 500, there have been, there have been owner, owner-operated companies. So what do we know? Microsoft, yep. uh, Walmart, Sam Walton, um, Andy Grove with Intel, yep. uh, Hewlett and Packard, that's Messrs. Hewlett and Packard. They solve the agency problem about which so many academic papers have been written and people talk about how do you align management with, with shareholders? How about these kind of options? How about those kind of options? How about delayed? How about restricted stock? 
But here's the essential difference. It has to do with incentive system. Yeah. Jack Welsh, no knock on him. His intelligence, his integrity, his creativity, his, his dedication, he's got it all, let's say. But the reality of it is that his path to true wealth was through his compensation system. Geez, don't press go down. Yeah. Which is a, a highly, no doubt, a very thick, highly negotiated document. Yeah. Right? When you have Steve Jobs or Carl Icahn, right, where 80 or 90 or 100% of their wealth virtually, right, take a CEO who's worth $500 million and 450 of it is in his stock or her stock. Their path to true wealth yeah. is through capital appreciation over time, long-term return on capital. It solves, actually what it does is, the decision-making process for them is entirely different. They become stewards of the, yeah, exactly right. First of all, they have capital at risk. It's the most important aspect. You can have $50 million worth of stock in the company that you were granted, but it's not your capital yep. at risk. And they make decisions that are entirely different about expansion or acquisition or costs or risk. And over time, those accumulate. So, you'll find that if you isolate the owner-operated companies out of the S&P 500 over time, while they're owner-operated companies, meaning Walmart, from the time it went in, at, a, I think, a 25 basis point weighting, to the time Sam Walton died, when it might have been a 2% weighting. Yep. Think of that. But not afterwards. And you just look at the annualized returns from those. It is like four percentage points a year a year average, in a rough way of calculating it, over the S&P 500. The true entrepreneurs, the true yeah. value creators. So we created a weak form of that, but I like it anyway, because it's an index, and you can't start making choices in the index. You have a rule set called the wealth index, and it was private labeled as a mutual fund by, by a company called Virtus, and it's called the Wealth Masters Fund. And it consists of companies in which the, a control party, doesn't have to be CEO, could be a, a director, mm -hmm. has a certain amount of money in, this, in the stock, um, and that's how, that, so they're, they're wealthy people, they have a certain influence in the stock, direct influence, and they have to have a certain amount of money, I think it's 200 million or 100 million dollars yeah. in the stock. And that's one way of doing it. And just to, to give you a little more flavor, maybe there was something special about the US market, culturally or geographically, that made this our back testing work. So we chose a market that was as far away culturally and geographically as we could get, which is Japan. And over the last 10 and 20 years, we created an index for Japan. And not only was it up in a market that was down over a decade or two, it actually outperformed the US market. Okay. And if it seems bizarre, it does. The capital at risk tells you. So here's an example, it's, it's, it's actually a real company. Let's say you have a company that makes diapers, Japan founder owns most of the stock. Why would this fellow put more money, more capital, into a new factory unless he thought he could get a good return on it? Yeah. He wouldn't do it. He might, if he thinks it's getting worse, he might withdraw his capital little by little, look for something else to do. But let's say he found an, a, a new niche, the aging population, adult diapers, and he thought he could get a good return and put the capital in. So it makes sense, because they will withdraw capital if they're not going to get a decent return, they yeah. don't expect to get a negative return. It's, it's entrepreneurship. That's yes. all it is. Plain, it's, it's good old-fashioned entrepreneurship. So that would be an example, something like a wealth index or an owner-operator index, of an index with predictive attributes as opposed to what we have, which is simply descriptive attributes. So there are ways, there are ways to do it. Stephen, I have no idea how long we've talked for, yep. uh, but every second of it has been instructional education in the extreme. So I, I'm not done with you yet. We've got more to talk about, but I guess we'll have to do 